We have another Bible reading, that's from Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to 39. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray before we look at this passage and learn from God's Word. Father, we thank you for this night when we can sing praises to Christ. We thank you for how he humbly came. We thank you that he came for us to die. And we thank you now that we can consider your Word and can consider what we truly love and cherish in Jesus And I pray now that you would open hearts to hear your word and to respond in a right way. And we pray this all for your glory. Amen. Well, it is an exciting time of the year, isn't it? There is lots to enjoy in this time of the year. But most importantly, as Christians, we remember the coming of Jesus now. We remember when he came and that he was born so that he could die. And we remember that he came to give his life so that many could have eternal life and be saved. But there is another coming of Jesus that I want us to think about that will happen. And its date is fixed in the future. Jesus is coming again. It could be today, tonight. It could be tomorrow. It could be any day. We don't know when it will happen. But on that day, Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he's coming to judge He is coming to condemn, and he is coming to deal justly with this world. And so it is not a safe day for so many people. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for when Jesus will return again? And do you feel safe for that day? Are you confident that you do not need to fear that day when you will have to give an account for all that you have done? Well, we actually can be confident for this day. We can be ready and feel safe for this day when Jesus will return again. Not because of anything in us, not because of anything that we are doing, but because of five gifts that all those who are in Jesus have. And we see these five gifts in the passage before us in Romans 8. If you're in Jesus, if you are saved and you're a Christian, then these things that we look at tonight, they are true about you, and you can confidently say them every single day in all eternity. If you're not saved, though, then I hope that as we look at these things that are true about the Christian, I hope it will give you a burning longing to want these things as well. And I hope and pray that it will cause you to go and satisfy that longing in Jesus, who can only give these things. So here we look here in this passage, Romans 8, here are five gifts that every Christian can say this Christmas, but this is something that every Christian can say for all eternity. Here are five gifts that we can say. Firstly, we can say that no one can be against me. Have a look, verse 31, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. It says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? What's the answer? No one. No one can be against us. No one can be against us. And it's because of what Paul, the writer here, has just said in verse 28 to 30, and also because of everything he's been saying in this whole book 
No one can be against us. Now, it's not that people won't be against you as a Christian. People will be against you in life, but they can't be against you and do anything significant against you or do anything that will cause eternal damage towards you. Life is going to be full of forces that will be against us as Christians. We know this. We're going to see this later in the passage as well. War is always upon us as a Christian. There's spiritual attacks. There is damaging, sinful desires that are always attacking us. But even though all hell, in a sense, was, is raging against us, even though that may be happening, we can say that no one is against us because our greatest ally is for us. The greatest ally is for us. God, in all his strength, is for us. He's on our side. He's for us in the ways that verse 28 to 30 have shown us. I won't read them, but it spoke of him working all for our good, for those who love him. That's how he's for us. He's making us more like Jesus. And he is completing the saving work that he has begun. God is for us. And so no one can be against us. I think of it like this. When I was thinking about this point, I think of it like this. Imagine if we as Australia, as a country, had China and the US backing us, and they were our allies, probably the two greatest armies and countries in the world at the moment, and they are backing us. And then New Zealand comes and says, we're going to attack you. Now, they might come against us, but really, they can't do anything significant against us with these two great powers with us. They can't do anything significant. We as Christians have God, the greatest one ever, as our ally. And so we can say, though things will come against us, no one can be against me. No one can do anything against me. Secondly, what can the Christians say? Those who are in Jesus, what can they say? Well, they can say that no one can be against me. They can also say that no one can hold from me all that I need. Verse 32 says this, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Now, verse 32 isn't teaching us that life is going to be amazing if you're a Christian. It's not saying that you'll get all you want if you're in Jesus. Because verse 35 to 36 show us some pretty horrible things that come come to those who are in Jesus. So it's not saying that. But in the context, if you look at verse 28 to 30, we see here what Paul is trying to say is the all things here, talked about in verse 32, is referring to all that we need to be conformed to Jesus and to endure to the end and be saved. We will have all that we need to ultimately be saved. And he's saying here, God has given his son. God has given the greatest one, the greatest and most precious gift. Nothing could have costed God more than giving his son, and he has given us Christ. And so he will not withhold anything that we need to endure and ultimately be saved. He's given the greater by giving Jesus. He will also give the lesser. I know for me, one of the hardest and greatest things for me to give up, and for many of you who are parents would feel this too, one of the hardest and greatest things to give up would be our children. They are so precious to us. Here we're seeing God gave what was most precious to him. And so because of that, we can have a certainty that God will do all that we need to be saved and forgiven for eternity. Thirdly, what can those who are in Jesus confidently say? We can say that no one can bring a charge against me. Have a look. Verse 33, it says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Charges and accusations, they come to us from Satan, from others when we fall into sin, but they really have no substance because of what this verse says. Because God is the one who justifies us. God is the one who has made us right and declared that we are not guilty before him. God is the one who has declared that we are right in his sight and that no charges can come against us. And he has declared that we have been forgiven of all our sin if we are in Christ. Past sins, present sins, future sins, all sins forgiven 
if we are in Christ. And so no charges can but get brought against us. No accusations can be made. I know for some people, they struggle with this, the fact that they can be forgiven. Sometimes when I talk with people about God's forgiveness and how they can be forgiven of all sin in Jesus, they really struggle. And they say, that, that's too wonderful, but God can't do that for me. I've strayed too far. My sin's too deep. God can't forgive me. That's how they feel. Maybe you are here tonight and you feel that as well. God can't forgive me. But what does Jesus say? He says that he came to seek and save the lost. And Jesus says that it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, Jesus came for those who are spiritually sick. He came for those who are in desperate need of forgiveness. He came for those whose sin is so great that it is horrid. He came for those who don't deserve God's forgiveness. He came for you, who have so many charges that could be brought against you because of your sin. But he came for you and cancelled that debt when it was nailed to him on the cross. So those who are in Jesus can say this, no charge can come against me. I'm forgiven. No charges can be laid against me. That's what those who are in Jesus can confidently say. Fourthly, in our passage, we see that those who are in Jesus can confidently say that no one can condemn me. No one can condemn me. Have a look. Verse 34. It says, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, what is it to be condemned? Well, it's when this, the punishment has been pronounced following the sentence, and the infinite sentence for our crimes has been pronounced by God because we have sinned against the infinite God, and it must be paid for. But, as Romans 1, 8 verse 1, the beginning of this chapter says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. So the Christian, those who are in Jesus, as we've been saying, does not have to face condemnation. Why? Why do they not have to face it? Well, this verse here gives us four reasons that I'll quickly give you. Four reasons why we don't need to be condemned for our sin. Firstly, the first reason in the verse, verse 34, is because Jesus died. He delivered us from our sin by dying in our place and our guilt has been paid. Secondly, we don't need to be condemned for our sin because Jesus was raised. God showed that the work he did through Jesus was effective by raising Jesus to life. Thirdly, we can be confident that we won't be condemned because now Jesus is at God's right hand. He's at the place of honor and God will honor all the work that Jesus has done. And then fourthly, we can be certain and sure that we will not be condemned because Jesus is at God's right hand interceding for us. John 17 shows something similar and says that Jesus is praying for us. The point here is Jesus is pleading for our good. For those who are in Jesus, he's sitting there before God pleading for our good so that we can be sure we will never be condemned. We will never be condemned for our sin. Picture it like this. Imagine in your mind this. You've been sent to court. You've been sent to court in another land for deliberately and continuously disobeying the king of that kingdom. And you've been sent to court for it. But in the courtroom, a man that you don't know comes forward and he starts claiming that he has done all those crimes that you actually did. And so because of that, the pronouncement's made upon him to go to jail for you. He goes to the prison and he comes out eventually alive one day, having paid the penalty for those crimes. And he comes out alive and he goes to sit at the right hand of the king. Because this man was actually the prince. He was the king's son. And now he sits at the right hand of that king, pleading for your good, defending you before the king for the rest of your life. That's what Jesus has done for the Christian, for those who are in Christ. And that's why they can say, no one can condemn me. Though my sin is great, 
though I have strayed so far and our guilt overwhelms us and engulfs us. No one can condemn me because of what Jesus has done. And now he sits interceding for us. And then finally, one final thing here in the passage that those who are in Jesus can say, it's this, no one can separate me from God's love. No one can separate me from God's love. Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the hope. That's what the Christian can say. Nothing can separate them from God's love. No hardship, no difficulty. Nothing can stop us from being ultimately saved and experiencing God's love. His love is unconditional and nothing can change this. No power or hardship can take this from us. Even though we might might be killed or slaughtered, as some of the verses talk about, we can't be separated from God's love. This is the great hope that the Christian has. And so these five things here, these five gifts that we've seen in in Romans chapter 8, these are what the Christian can confidently say. Those who are united to Jesus by faith can confidently say these things about themselves. And I ask you the question, can you say that? Can you say this about yourself? I hope if you can't, I hope that it makes you want to be able to say this and know this and have this reality in your life because Jesus is coming again and you will stand before him. And without these precious gifts that we have seen here, without them, Jesus' return should be a day that you fear because it is a day where he will be against you. It is a day where the record books will be opened and charges will be laid. It's a day where condemnation for the crimes you have done will be enforced. And it's a day where you will be, in fact, separated from God's love for eternity. And so, if this isn't true about you, I encourage you to come and join yourself to Jesus, the Saviour, who can give eternal life. Come, you who think you could never be forgiven, you who think your sin is is far too great to be forgiven, come, you who are lost, come, you who are engulfed by the guilt of your sin, you who feel spiritually sick, come to Jesus, because all that Jesus has done can cover this. All that he has done can cleanse you. All these gifts that you have in Jesus are enough for you to be forgiven and saved. So I offer you what we have seen in this passage. If you don't have it, come, find it in Jesus by relying on him to give you this, to give you salvation and forgiveness, which you desperately need. And come and take hold of it. Come and take hold of these precious gifts that are found in Jesus. If you don't have them, take hold of them tonight before it is too late. You don't know the day you'll die. You don't know when Jesus is coming. Come and take hold of them now, tonight. And be ready then for the day when he comes. And be ready for the day when Jesus returns. Take hold of Jesus. If you haven't done this, speak to me or or a Christian that you trust. And come and find forgiveness in what Christ has done. But if you are a Christian, if you are in Jesus tonight and you say, I do have these things, I can say them, I know them, then I want to challenge you. Live like they are live like they are a reality in your life. Live like they are a reality. Live like someone who really does say, no one can be against me. And therefore, I will not fear what life may bring. Because no one can be against me. Nothing can be against me. Live like these are a reality in your life. Live like someone who really does say, God will give me all I need to be ultimately saved. And therefore, I'm free to give all that I am and all that I have to his purposes. 
and live confident, saying, no one can condemn me. And therefore, you can say, I will not be paralyzed by guilt, but I will boldly serve Christ, though guilt sometimes plagues us, even as Christians. And for you who are in Christ, may God reveal hundreds of other ways as well where you need to live like these are a reality in your life because you're in Jesus and you can confidently say these five things. You confidently can be assured that you have these five gifts. So live like it. Let's pray. Our great God, we pray for any here tonight who do not know you, who do not have these wonderful gifts that are found in Jesus. We pray that they would, they would right now be brought to you. We pray as they feel their guilt for their sin, maybe some who feel that they can't be forgiven because their sin is so great. Father, we pray that they would see that Christ came to save people like this. He came to save those who are lost, those who are spiritually sick, those who are so deep in sin, he came to save them. Help them to see this. And I pray for any who aren't saved, God, may you draw them to Jesus to put their faith in him so that they can confidently say these wonderful things that we have seen. And for us who are saved, please, God, help us to live like these are a reality in our life so that we would shine all that we have in Jesus to so many in this world who desperately need it. We pray all of this. In Jesus' name, amen.